Welcome to our study this week of Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, through chapter 4, verse 11. My name is Scott Rainey. I serve with the Church of the Nazarene in the area of Nazarene Discipleship International, or NDI. This adult Sunday school video lesson is provided in collaboration between the Foundry Publishing and NDI. The Sunday school lesson is, is, is intended to support the local church's efforts to make disciples who make disciples. Please feel free to use this video in any way that helps your church and its families. I remember a lecture Dr. Darius Salter gave in one of my classes at Nazarene Theological Seminary. I believe the year was 1998, and the class was called Theology of Church and Ministry. The particular class lecture was about the uniqueness, the peculiarity, or maybe even the psyche of the pastor. I will never forget when Dr. Salter began to speak about pastors who kept so busy, they never took a Sabbath rest. He spoke about the Sunday meetings that often take place in a local church. It makes sense to have committee meetings at church on Sunday afternoon. We are already there for a morning or an evening service. We can simply make one trip to the church for several different purposes. The result of such a schedule on Sunday, however, is a lack of rest. Dr. Salter began to speak to us, the soon-to-be pastors. He said, who do you think you are? Do you think the command of God to rest does not include you? Do you actually think you are too important to take a day off each week for rest? Do you think that you are needed that much? If you simply say no to a meeting in order to take a nap on Sunday afternoon, would the world really come crashing down? Then he said something like this, let me tell you what would happen if you died tomorrow. Your spouse would mourn for you for a period of time. It would be hard on her to have you gone, but time would begin to heal her heart. Maybe in six months or a year, your spouse would receive a phone call from a would-be suitor and she would go on a dinner date with someone else. Your church would mourn your loss. They would have your funeral. In about one month, the district superintendent would call the secretary of the church board and ask for an invitation to the next board meeting. The board would talk about you, how much they miss you, and how much they loved you. Then the DS would share a list of names who the board could consider for their next pastor. In a few months, the church would continue on with a new minister. Finally, Dr. Salter said, the world would move on without you. Do you think it would be okay if you take Sunday afternoon off to rest your weary soul? <laughs> Maybe that illustration is a little dark, but it gets the point across well. God has instituted a Sabbath rest for his children. As we continue our study of the book of Hebrews this week, we enter a passage of scripture that speaks to the biblical concept of rest. The idea of rest is multifaceted, really. It's more than just taking a day off each week. The concept of rest is rooted in God's creation week. It finds itself in the Ten Commandments. There is a spiritual element to the idea of rest. Rest can be something we look at in the past, in the present, and in the future. There are a couple of questions we might even find ourselves asking. How can we enter into God's rest? And when does God intend for us to experience such rest? So let's see what the writer to the Hebrews has to say about such things. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the end. As has just been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in their rebellion. 
who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Chapter four, therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we have, we who have believed enter that rest, just as God has said, so I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. For somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter the re that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, God again set a certain day calling it today. This he did when a long time later he said he spoke through David as as in the passage already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joseph had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath day, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their work, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. <clears throat> this week's passage in Hebrews chapter three and chapter four is actually an explanation of or a commentary on Psalm 95 verses seven through 11. The writer of Hebrews quotes Psalm 95 three times in our study today to warn the people against rebellion and unbelief. To fully understand this, I want to take us back to Israel's history in Egypt. For 400 years, Israel was in slavery in Egypt. Pharaoh's tyranny over the Israelite slaves was vividly presented in the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter one, verse 13 says that Pharaoh worked them ruthlessly. A primary feature of tyranny is that the oppressed are denied the opportunity for rest. The Israelites were oppressed and had no rest. When God forcibly loosened Pharaoh's grip on, e on Israel, God allowed, even commanded Israel to observe a weekly Sabbath of ceasing work to rest. This was a perpetual reminder that God is not a tyrant, but a loving and gracious emancipator who gives both the gift of work and the gift of rest. The promised land, Canaan, was to be the place of rest for God's people as they left Egypt. As you know from Israelite history, the people of God victoriously and miraculously came out of Egyptian bondage. They traveled to the Jordan River. Twelve spies scouted the, out the promised land for 40 days. In fear of the Canaanite people living in the land, the Israelites did not believe that the same God who had delivered them from Egypt could also take them into the promised land. So instead of entering the place of rest, because of their unbelief and, and disobedience, God sent them back into the desert for 40 years. Numbers chapter 14, verse 34 says, for 40 years, 
one year for each of the 40 days you explored the land. You will suffer for your sins and know what it is like, what it is like to have me against you. The Israelites of Moses' day had fallen into the sin of unbelief. Christian readers who read the letter to the Hebrews must avoid the same path of disobedience. As you can see from Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, the writer to the Hebrews considered an unbelieving heart as the root cause for disobedience, sinful behavior, and eventually a person's turning away from God. The Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 14, verse 23, everything that does not come from faith is sin. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So in the end, if someone is struggling to obey God, the root cause is a lack of faith. Here's the point. There's a direct connection between believing and obeying. The songwriter, John Samus, wrote, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who trust and obey. Trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. The author of Hebrews then instructs us to encourage one another daily, according to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13. The word today emphasizes the critical opportunity of the moment for the believers to admonish and encourage one another. Satan's primary weapon is deceit. John chapter 8, verse 44 calls the enemy the father of lies. The audience of Hebrews struggled with the deceitful lie that their situation, their persecution by both the Jews and the Romans, would improve by rejecting Christ and returning to Judaism. Interestingly, it was the same lie that caused the Israelites to rebel against Moses in a belief that life would somehow be better if they simply went back to Egypt. It's important for us to remember that Unbelief is never just a personal issue. Corporate faithfulness requires every one of us to watch out for another's spiritual well-being. No one in the community of faith can become self-satisfied and desensitized to the danger of spiritual drift. So we must encourage one another every day so that no one is hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14, brings all of this back to Christ. We share in Christ, this verse says, if we hold our original conviction to the end, if we continue believing and obeying to the end. Sure, a person enters into a saving relationship with Christ by making an initial commitment of faith and trust in Christ for salvation. The faith that brings final salvation, however, is not momentary mental assent. True saving grace is characterized by the ongoing action of holding firm to one's commitment to faith and obedience to Christ to the very end. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 15 to 19, the writer moves us back once again to the day of Moses. We're reminded that Moses led the people out of Egyptian slavery, but because of unbelief, they rebelled against God and did not trust him. Therefore, they were not allowed to enter God's rest, and they died in the desert. As we begin into Hebrews chapter 4, we learn the good news. The promise of entering his rest still stands. The people of the wilderness had failed to possess the inheritance due to their unbelief, but the promise of rest was still valid for their children who later did enter the promised land. And that promise of rest is still available to anyone who believes today. We'll come back to that in just a little bit. The author of Hebrews once again points to the responsibility of the believing community for one another. 
Hebrews chapter four, verse one says, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. That is the promise of entering his rest. Let us be careful can be literally translated from the Greek, let us fear. The Hebrew believers should have a fearful concern for any member who might fall short of God's salvation and victory in Christ. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 says it this way, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. This is a church that's willing to risk, to give their life away so that everyone continues in the faith of obedience. This means having the loving yet tough conversations that need to happen along the way of discipleship. <clears throat> this is dealing with sin and disobedience with honesty for the sake of the brother or sister, not with fear and trembling over their possible response, but with fear and trembling over the reality for the wayward believer if they do not hold on to the promise of God. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, reveals the answer to the, this, to the important question, who may enter God's rest? First, it is not just the person who hears the good news. The author reminds the reader that both the Israelites of old and the Hebrews in the early church had the good news proclaimed to them, according to verse 2. The Israelites in Moses' day heard the good news of God's rest, but they did not believe and they rebelled against the Lord. So hearing the good news alone is of no value. The crucial factor is whether the good news is accepted by faith and obeyed. The writer of the Hebrews again draws the connection between faith, obedience, and entering the desired rest of God. The message of the gospel has no redeeming value unless the hearers accept the message by faith and obedience. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 3, we learn that we who have believed enter that rest. The Greek verb translated enter is in the present tense. This underscores the reality that God's rest is both a promise for the future in glory and a promise for now, for today. How might we understand God's Sabbath rest today? To answer that question, let's move to the last segment of our passage for this week. Both in ancient Israel and for God's people since, God's gift of Sabbath is precious. God intends the Sabbath day not merely as a passive ceasing from work, but as a positive rest. A regular weekly Sabbath gives us time and space to acknowledge and experience our life as God's created and redeemed children. God does not want us obligated to human tyrants who always require labor in the times, places, and circumstances of the tyrants fixing. Rather, God intends human flourishing in healthy and fulfilling rhythms of work and rest. Jesus himself affirmed this in his invitation in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. But the Christian version of the Sabbath rest goes deeper than simply ceasing work, going to church, and taking a nap. The author's major point in our passage this week is that God has a bigger, better, deeper rest for all who will accept it by faith. That rest is available today for anyone who would believe and obey. The most famous prayer in St. Augustine's Confessions asserts this, you have made us for yourself and our heart is restless until it rests in you. For the one who's lost in sin, Hear me today. There is a rest that is only found in Christ. You can experience this rest today by putting your trust in Jesus as your Savior and Lord. There is a rest that comes in conversion that transforms a life. 
Follow him in obedience today. God's rest includes salvation. Charles Wesley's hymn, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, prays these words, let us all in thee inherit, let us find that second rest. What is this second rest that Charles Wesley spoke of? Theologians and pastors in the Wesleyan tradition have preached that today's rest includes the state of purity and holiness in the lives of true believers, according to H. Orton Wiley. Some have called entire sanctification the rest of faith. That is a complete and total surrender of trust in God, resting fully in him. This is the second work of grace, a place of rest in the heart of the one who follows Jesus in full surrender to the will of God, filled with his Holy Spirit and heart cleansed. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 and 24 says, May God himself, the God of peace, that sounds like rest, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. God's rest includes entire sanctification. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 10 seems to give us one more aspect of God's rest, a heavenly view. The author says, for anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. The Sabbath rest can also refer to the time when the struggle of this present life, the effort of running the race set before us, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, and the pursuit of peace and holiness, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, will reach their ultimate goal in heaven. There is a Sabbath rest that all who believe will one day enter. God's rest includes our glorification when we all go to heaven as Christian believers. When we started, I shared that rest was multifaceted. To understand it best, we must take a little walk through history. Rest has its origin in God from the days of creation, Genesis chapter 2. Moses passed on the command of God for a day of rest to remind the Israelites that he had freed them from tyranny, Exodus chapter 20. Years later, King David reminded the Israelites that they truly wanted, if they truly wanted to enter God's rest, they must believe on the Lord and live in obedience to him, Psalm chapter 95. In the early church, Hebrew believers connected the importance of faith, obedience, and entering the rest of God that was available now, Hebrews chapters 3 and 4. The promise of entering his rest still stands for you and me today. If we will believe on Jesus, walk in obedience to him, and keep on believing to the end. And there is more good news. There is coming an eternal rest that is heaven for all those who believe. You can experience his rest in salvation and sanctification today. And that rest will last for eternity. <laughs>